You're listening to the Digital Void Podcast, a weekly exploration of digital culture, media, technology, and memes, featuring critical conversations with experts at the forefront of our digital moment. My name is Josh Chapdelaine, and my co-host is Dr. Jamie Cohen. Have you ever felt like you were on the edge of a rabbit hole? Then you might be playing the game. Of course, most people who play the game don't really ever talk about the game. Some say the game has been around for centuries, but the modern iteration of the game began in 1959. The game I'm referring to is Rabbits, a mysterious alternate reality game that uses the entire world as its canvas. It uses both digital technology as well as the physical world to hook players into a game where the stakes can be life and death. Rabbits is a novel and podcast series developed by writer, producer, and director Terry Miles. Miles is the founder and CEO of Minnow Beats Whale, and one of the creators of The Black Tapes. He also produces Tannis and Rabbits, among many other projects. Miles is a storyteller who helped pioneer the podcasting world as we know it. After Sarah Koenig revolutionized investigative podcasts in 2014 with Serial, Miles created a fictional version of an investigative podcast titled The Black Tapes. The Black Tapes showed what was possible for fictional podcasting, coming months before popular shows like Limetown. In our conversation, Miles explains the origins of The Black Tapes and how digital technology and media are so central to the stories he tells. Then, Miles explores the worlds he helps to tell stories about, from Tannis which is hosted by his cousin Nick Silver, to Rabbits itself. I was really interested in speaking with Terry to discuss the true immersion that people experience when they engage with his work. He retrieves the playful, experiential, and immersive sensibility that I feel best displays the potential of the internet, podcasting, and storytelling. Specifically, Rabbits, both the podcast and novel, speak to our current digital moment when anything and everything can lead to another clue, another portal, another trailhead, our world tends to flatten. It's easy for some to feel convinced that the world itself is a gigantic ARG. I'm thrilled to bring you a wide-ranging conversation spanning Miles' work on the black tapes in Tannis to his recent novel, Rabbits, and what lies ahead. Here's this week's conversation with Terry Miles. Terry, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. I'm excited to do it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. I, I'd love to start at the beginning with your work. In 2014, you famously listened to Serial and decided to create a fictional spinoff podcast, The Black Tapes. The Black Tapes is truly, and I mean truly, a genre-defining work for p- fictional podcasting. So if you haven't yet listened, please go back. But What is truly interesting to me about the Black Tapes is your ability to tell an engaging story in what was at the time a developing medium for fiction that relies so heavily on other forms of media. It really wasn't an obvious decision. Whether it be investigating Dr. Strand's collection of VHS Black Tapes to characters analyzing waveforms for hidden clues about potential connections between events— Before we dive into your podcasts themselves, though, I'd love to zoom out on podcasting as a medium. What affordances does the medium give you to develop deeply constructive narratives that rely on digital technology? Yeah, well, podcasting was something I've been really excited about from, you know, like 2000 two or whatever, like when, when I first sort of discovered, I was listening to KCRW and, and, you know, then Ricky Gervais came along and, uh. Kevin Smith and there were there were um and, and a number of comedy podcasts but I, I just loved that like I would go for runs and I, I my music started to turn into podcasts and and pretty soon I was but of course I was you know making independent films at the time so I was you know there was a lot of like how to podcasts that I would use as inspiration the medium was always always um in the back of my mind I, I just loved as a mu- recovering musician let's say I I I love audio so. Um, but it, but it was serial that really, really did it. The, like the first big true crime thing, like the, the combination, the storytelling was nonfiction, but I heard something immediately in that, that spoke to me that 
and I knew I wanted to tell a fictional story in that, using that format right away. I mean, maybe the Blair Witch Paranormal Activity last broadcast and alternate reality game, faux, faux reality, uh, you know, that, that's always been sort of top of mind for me. In, 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 I've always wanted to create something that was like that. And then Serial sort of pulled the trigger for me. And it was well creating that coming from uh, being a filmmaker, a writer, director, producer, I, I was sort of learning all of the things that were super exciting about, about the form of narrative storytelling in the podcast format as I was writing it, or perhaps uh, mixing it as a better, um, or even let's go further, listening to it in the woods as I would, you know, uh, output each mix. I was like, this is, this is cool. But there was a point at which cereal was ending and I would wake up every day and think somebody's going to make a fake cereal. I have to do this first. I have to. And, and there was no way that I would be able to. And then like nine months went by and I uh, recruited a friend of mine to, to help and, and, um, and the Black Tapes was born. So the Black Tapes is born and it's not until a few years later that I discover your work. But when I first engaged with the Black Tapes, I found myself totally immersed by Dr. Strand and Alex Regan's story. But because of the, in part because of the production, but also because of the experience of feeling this story develop through a new medium, it reminded me of what I imagine people must have felt listening to Orson Welles' 1938 reading of War of the Worlds on terrestrial radio. But you've gone a step further uh, to include new methods of interactivity in developing your stories. Alex Regan had an active Twitter, and so does your cousin, Nick Silver. Hmm. So how does the interactivity of social media inform your world building? Um, it just seems like a natural extension of, of that. And also, there was there's promotional aspects of it at the time. Like it was, we really wanted to get listeners. An interesting thing about the Black Tapes, uh, which was my partner, Paul Bay and I, creation it wasn't just me um there was we never advertised the black tape so it was all word of mouth so the the only mouths we really had were social media accounts so uh so that was why we would we end, but but you know so so my overarching plan before i even brought paul paul into my idea of creating this uh, fictional podcast was that it would be real so in order to sort of expand on that reality we had to create or I, I decided to create all of this stuff. That was really all me, the sort of faux reality part of it. That was the sort of my, and the Pacific Northwest stories, the creation of a, of, um, of a shared universe, sort of, that was all me. That, that's always been something I've, I've, I've been obsessed with that since the Michael Moorcock Eternal Champion stuff, and then the Secret Wars, Marvel stuff. It's just always been top of mind. It's not so, so much the more recent Marvel ex MCU, but you know, that's cool too. But yeah, I forgot the question as I was rambling, or unless I answered it, in which case. Yeah, no, you definitely touched upon an element. I was curious about how the interactivity of social media informs your world building. I remember listening to the Black Tapes and binging it at the time and listening to some of the Twitter comments or threads and some of the voicemails that were left by audience members. So you're building these worlds in real time as the narratives develop on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something like an alternate reality game thing. Um, you know, I ran an ARG a long time ago and, uh, that was the most exciting aspect of it was when the story stuff was gone, which was chewed through in a matter of days. Then it was just an an active sort of, you know, hang on and see what happens as I, you know, interact with all of the people engaged in the game. And it was similar with that, uh, you know, a, a lesser element, you know, or a lesser degree of that thing with the Black Tapes Twitter and sort of engaging with our audience. And all of those voicemails were real. There's a lot of people who <laughs> thought that they were actors. Um, you know, I, I guess I've, I've earned that, uh, you know, <laughs> that suspicious uh, <laughs> take. So, so there are examples of people calling the black tapes and thinking that the story is an authentic story that Dr. Richard Strand exists and Alex Regan is a real radio host, correct? Yeah, I created that um, Strand website, the Strand Institute website and stuff as there are with all the podcasts. Um 
Yeah, we, we would get every week, we would get people terrified that they just heard a sound that was going to kill them. And we had to tell them it was fake. And I would never do that <laughs> because, you know, where's the fun in that? <laughs> it's, it's real. I mean, yeah, govern yourselves accordingly. You were warned. So I, I really love the idea of using multiple or multimodal experiences to tell stories. I, I, I love the way that you do that. So I have two, two questions. One is how much pre-planning goes into the multimodal experience? Like how many do you, do you map out character arcs in social media profiles? Do you mention them so you know how they operate longitudinally? Or is it pretty much on the fly, like people respond and you respond to that? It's only on the fly. Yeah, I mean, the, the the material itself is, let's use the Black Tapes as an example, the only fictional show I've ever done, um, uh, which may or may not be true. Uh, there is, it's very tightly scripted. So um, due to the nature of the plot and the mythology and all of the, um, you know, the, the structurally and, and cliffhangerness of it, there's, uh, there's no real room for improvisation or sort of... Um, you know, off the cuff manipulation, but, but, but when it, once it's released into the world, then it's all just seat of the pants stuff. There's, there's no, um, you know, there's no, although I have in, in the, the past, uh, written narratives that, that would be like one on YouTube that would sort of dovetail with the one, um, on the show that, that I was doing way back in the old days in the, my first ARG experience. And I plan on doing a lot more of that in the future. It's just been busy writing books and, and trying to write, um, trying to sell TV shows by writing pilots for them and, and, or selling them and then writing them and then having them not be made really is the, is the process I've been going through for, for since 2016, I think. So that's, that's an, that's exactly what I was about to bring up too, which is that this is a very, um, internet native content. So it's tough for like corporate media to like kind of buy in the I bring up the idea of like these extra characters or multimodal experiences because I really miss the days of early web series that incorporated social media profiles for their fictional characters so that they could interact with an audience it was a way of branching or breaching YouTube content to an audience to communicate and this is it was both world building script writing and uh, feedback systems at the exact same time and I miss it I feel like we've lost that when we lost the, or maybe we've gained cynicism. So we've lost the willingness to interact with that. Did you, did you feel like a lot of those voicemails and in the fiction, in the fiction projects, did you feel like a lot of those voicemails and interactions like helped you develop how these stories would develop over time? And then do you feel like this is why corporate broadcasting can't like figure it out? Because it's like, it all, it works solely in the internet. I think that that's the, but the last thing you said is absolutely true. Um, there's so many things in there. At first, if you're not cynical, then you're not paying attention. Um, but th for the last thing you said, like, I feel like I, I miss that sort of, I think that that's exactly right. That's sort of the, the, an old web series that would be peopled with characters that had biographies and Facebook pages and, and uh, you know, like, or Dianea House, like the, these sort of like text-based um, exchanges that were, you know, predated creepy pasta and and were just like super exciting and 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 new I, I that those are inspirations for me like I try to carry the energy of that through what I'm doing I don't know whether I'm successful or not but that those are the things that you know all that it continue to the web is like or like the web 1.0 or whatever it was filled with like exciting weirdness and podcasting now like the sort of the last thing you said like the I, I feel like like a celebrity led fictional podcast is simply War of the Worlds without the part that I like the best, you know, without the faux reality. So all you're left, even though but War of the Worlds I'm sure didn't feature movie stars at the time. Like if I hear um Catherine Keener on the radio, I mean it's Catherine Keener, it's not it's not Jane Smith or the Doctor or whatever. So for me um, where, where audio drama is sits now with celebrity stuff and Marvel stuff and all of that is exciting and cool to bring listeners to the space as they call it, <laughs> hate these terms, but like it, it, it's, uh, it's not for me. It's not really that exciting for me. Like I would do it. I mean, I, I suppose I, I could, or would, I mean, I have the, the skills to work in that, in that way. 
like in in the bigger studio with just like that sort of antiseptic and then you add the you know reverbs and everything mm -hmm. sound effects later but um it just seems like old time radio to me which is fine but it's not moving anything forward and i don't really want to listen to mystery theater right now and you you touch upon the authenticity of the media and specifically your work and i recall an interview you did where you said that you like to capture environments that you like to capture sound in real spaces can you walk us through how you capture uh, ambient noise and go on location for shoots and how you feel that authenticity informs your work? Well, back then with the Black Tapes in the first few seasons of Tannis, it was essentially just a Zoom recorder because I just wanted to make sure that the characters had exactly what, or that the actors held exactly what the character would hold in the way that they held it. So that's the nature of the sound of all those things is the true crime podcast sound or the documentarian sound. Like I'm a filmmaker by trade, so as things expanded... I always just wanted to use a boom mic and just capture because for me, I feel like movies, it's sort of a trick now. Like I don't want, I can hear it if it's a, if it's a Neumann mic in a, in a soundproof studio and they've added reverb and pan the character as they walk across the stage, the you know, sort of digital stage in the mixing board. So it's like that, that doesn't, I'm not in a room with someone. I, you know, that's not, that's not real, but I know why they're doing it. I mean, they want it to sound expensive, right? Cause these things can be expensive now, but it's not real. So I, I think that there's either, either you have the character hold the thing, the, the recorder or the mic, the way that a journalist would do it, who's not even a sound person, right? So they, they don't, neither is an actor. So they, there's similar, you're getting the, the real feeling of the thing, but then I also like cheating and having it be like a film because we're used to film certain types of, you know, most films, if they're good and naturalistically acted, we feel a sense of immersion in reality. We we have a, a connection to that sort of uh, Sennheiser boom mic sound. So I like that as well. I'll use that on location as well. And then that feels like fake reality, but it's not like that Neumann dynamic or I guess that's a condenser, but like that Neumann mic in a, in a studio booth. Although that's how the narration is done, you know, always. That's how I'm speaking to you now. Through <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the effect that gives the black tapes such an authenticity. That's what captured my immersion in the story. Uh, I want to look a little bit back at uh, the origins of your mysteries and again, how digital technology is so central to them. The black tapes helps build a world that includes the first Pacific Northwest Stories podcast, which then branches off into reality with Tannis. Tannis is the work you do with your cousin Nick Silver to create or to help tell the story of a world focused on one last internet mystery. And this is your first podcast project following the Black Tapes. So can you briefly explain the origin of this internet mystery, how you revealed it, how you worked with Nick to develop it, and Again, how digital technology, the authenticity, the intimacy of the medium is so central to telling this story and how it's possible without big budgets or clean studios. Yeah, that's a good, good my, my cousin Nick, who sounds exactly like me to some people's ears. Um, weird. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Um, like I mentioned earlier, so the, um, the Black Tapes was my friend Paul and I, and the reason it's called the Black Tapes is because I went, I went over to his... I was coming up with a fake serial. I'd started doing that. That was my plan. That was happening no matter what. But I'd done everything myself up to that. I was a filmmaker who sort of, you know, wrote and directed his own stuff. I didn't, I didn't have um, collaborators on the writing, producing side. So I brought my friend Paul in, and we had written a script called The Black Tapes, you know, a couple of years earlier. And he, he was really not that excited about... Um, making a podcast, frankly, he was like, Oh, cool. It sounds like you're really excited about this thing. This is your passion. And then he said, it's too bad. We couldn't do it with the black tapes. And then that was when the two things met and, uh, and we just high fived and we were very excited and, and, and um, yeah, you know, serial met the paranormal and um, we took some aspects of our script and uh, including Dr. Strand and then <clears throat> merged him with the Alex Regan character that I had in my mind. And, and that was that. But after the black, but again, like I mentioned earlier, the Pacific Northwest stories of it all, that part of that interconnected world 
my friend Paul wasn't all that excited about where I was like invested. Like that was the part I, I'm like, there's going to be another one. And then there'll be a true crime one that we make up. That's not, it's like, this is serial, but it's with, which, you know, of course is happening every day now. And then Limetown came around like six months after the black tapes and, and, and uh, the message after that. So all of a sudden these female, um, uh, you know, NPR style narrators were <laughs> like telling f- fictional stories. It was, um, we opened the floodgates to a whole new thing, which was exciting. Um, but in, in, in that spirit, Tan- Tannis was something that I had always want. I wanted to make as a movie, um, years earlier, a lot of years earlier. And, uh, I finally, I just started making it and then, and Paul was, was like, well, I don't, he didn't really have any bandwidth to do more. He just was wanted to focus on the black tape. So I said, well, I'm, so I just actually played him the first episode and I said, Hey, I'm because I take care of all of the, like on the black tapes, we both wrote them, but I did everything else. So I said, you know, because I'm doing all these other things, let's just put it on the network. Let's, um, you know, and, and I can use the black tapes to launch Tannis as a second show. And Paul's like, yeah, cool. Totally. So, uh, yeah. So I put it under the umbrella, although it was just me. It, I, I didn't have anyone else helping me on, on Tannis, except for my cousin, Nick, of course, obviously, um, you know, the narrator. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was the birth of Tannis and, and, and Tannis is definitely deeply connected to, um, to the internet and that the, the world of internet conspiracy and stuff. And, and those breadcrumbs, uh, begin in newspapers and they transfer into the internet and searches. And, and I see that again and again throughout your work. Uh, it's interesting. I, I've heard a lot of people mention that you sound like your cousin, Nick, and I don't hear it <laughs> at all. Um, uh, it's really strange. Me, me either. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is strange. Um, th- that's, that was a, 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 another interesting thing about Tannis before I, I forget that you, you triggered. There was like the Craigslist ad that um, is posted in the first episode. <laughs> yeah. The, like Tannis really took off with a specific type of listener, like a lot like me, I'm imagining. And, for the first two seasons, I could type in Tannis Craigslist and, and so many ads would come up that people had made all over the world seeking wow. Tannis runner want runner available or runner wanted. Wow. It was wild. They were like in like incredibly uh, disparate locations all over the world. It was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. You, you encourage immersivity and buy-in through your stories that I think is really rare. You mentioned shows like Limetown and those shows were very successful in their own rights, but there's the special sauce of authenticity, immersivity, interactivity that I think really helps to set the model for what can be done in podcasting. And I'd love to take a few steps ahead. I know you worked on other projects in between Black Tapes and Tennis and Rabbits, but your most recent work is Rabbits. And before we jump into Rabbits, the podcast and the book, Let's ask a question that gets everyone who works on either writing or developing ARGs in trouble. What is an alternate reality game? (laughs) I guess it's, um, could be described as a real world, how about a game that uses the real world as its playing board or canvas, an immersive real world game? Right, right. And so... Beginning in 1999, which is oftentimes seen as an example of a predecessor to or the primary inspiration to ARGs and Ong's Hat, and soon spanning to Majestic and the Beast in the early 2000s, ARGs feel present and center in the last two decades, slower at first and more so today. What is the appeal of ARGs to people and why are they having a cultural moment? Um, they've all, the appeal I think is that since the same reason I created Tannis, it's the, the, the longing for mystery in the world that you felt when you were younger and you were engaging with things you didn't understand. And, you know, the internet has been, has been both sides of the, has been, you know, illuminating and taking away that mystery and also, you know, giving, giving uh, it back, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's that it's mystery for me that that it's always been that sense that there's and also being not really a spiritual person like not a believer in um lives after this one 
it's kind of um, a way to reach for something that's more, you know, something some, or, the, or something that feels like it's more, even if it's an illusion. It's all death avoidance. <laughs> ultimately, 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 right? <laughs> it always is. It always comes down to uh, some form of transcendence. So you've constructed a narrative that includes two seasons of a podcast and a novel. Uh, and by saying narrative, I mean, you're just telling the story of what's really happening. Obviously. And all, all, are, all are titled rabbits, right? And so you've been asked in almost every interview I've read or heard of yours, what is rabbits? And I'm almost more interested to learn not what is rabbits, because is is a tricky word. I mean, what is it? What isn't it, right? Um, it's kind of everything, right? So rather than what is rabbits, what is the premise of rabbits to the players who play and what does its underlying sensibility reveal about how we're collectively approaching our digital world? Well, what does it mean to the people who play? I mean, I, I feel like the, you're going into something like rabbits the same way you'd go into something like cicada three, three Oh one. Like it's, is this, is this an NSA CIA or, a, you know, sl slip in other <laughs> you know, insidious, nefarious, or just um, neutral organization looking to recruit people who are good at, at solving um, puzzles, finding patterns, spotting coincidences that are um, beyond a regular coincidence. Um, so that's what the players are, are seeing. I mean, that that's, that's level one. You're going in and that's that's rabbits. We don't talk about it. It's hidden in the corners of the internet. It's like, it's a thing. It isn't a thing. But of course, as if you, you know, go through the, the book and listen to the podcast, you begin to realize that it could be something much more, something perhaps, you know, very dangerous. And uh, yeah, that's, that's rabbits. And what was the second part of the question that was so eloquently phrased that I don't know, I, I was listening to the, to the words and not listening to the content. Yeah. Well, well, the, the response was great, too. I was curious about its underlying sensibility uh, and what it reveals about how we're collectively approaching our digital moment. I, I can only say me. For me, again, it uh, it's always been like we used to call it transmedia, I think, back in the day where, where like one story would be. You know, I remember I was consulting for, for people back in like 2002 or one or two about, about this stuff, which I feel like should have exploded a lot more than it has. By 2022, um, ARGs in particular are, you know, certainly the three of us are, you know, well-versed and engaged and excited and um, aware, although I'm not that aware about the, the current status, but but shouldn't they be much bigger <laughs> by now? Like, it feels like the, like a video game. It, like, I've always, like, I, I see Rabbits as, you know, a, a novel, a, a comic, a, a podcast, um, a television show, some films, um, definitely games. Um, I don't know if it's like a, a, a smaller Steam game, a kind of like Tacoma, like uh, move through the world, but, uh, or perhaps a triple A game, although that doesn't really make a lot of sense for rabbits, I don't think. But I, I always want to want to tell that story and see that story as unfolding um, in different media. And, and, and of course, I left out the most important media of all, which is the internet, which is the, the, the base and, and the, the sort of the sort of heart of everything when it comes to rabbits is is the online is the digital wasteland that that um, houses these kind of things and and that's where the most exciting stuff will be that's where the you know a, a narrative in the comment section of you know ESPN and and uh, you know the, the the places you know and visit often um, starts to sprawl and, and, and move into a, a podcast. And then all of a sudden it's on your television. Um, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's sort of like where the way I see rabbits in this moment. Yeah. I think it answers my question because I think we're all longing for interactivity. And we spoke with an ARG developer, uh, Reed Berkowitz uh, a few months ago, and he drew up this great framework about how QAnon is similar to an alternate reality game and how people are finding clues and hints in almost everything to confirm their biases and constructing narratives in real time. So it feels like we are very much at a moment 
when the internet creates this flattening effect whereby creators and consumers are in a constant state of negotiation with one another to be able to play with and alter, edit and adjust reality in real time to help construct these narratives. So it, everything feels super cogent about what you said. I know uh, Jamie has a follow up to this as well. But it is, you're, <laughs> it is terrifying. You're terrifyingly correct about QAnon. Like I, I look at some of the, some of the conclusions and the weird shit that they, they, they pull together. And I'm like, I'm amazed. I just wish that it would be in service of something else, something not so, you know, ridiculous and harmful, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, sometimes I do pull back and I'm like, that is kind of brilliant that you, you came up with that with all of those like weird, like that's exactly like an ARG designer would do, do it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you bring back to the past of that, like you bring up the, 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 consultations you may have been doing in the early 2000s that's when i stepped into this field like i was i was in school still but i was reading henry jenkins work and the transmedia experience that occurred with the matrix at the time was like the the thing that was like the thing to think about and at the exact same moment as the matrix doing its cross promotional materials across different platforms. We didn't have access to the answers, so to speak. So it was like a little bit different. But at the exact same moment, so people were using Google Maps to figure out where the next survivor was going to be taped. And they were realizing that you could play with Google Maps sort of like a discovery tool. And so when you jump ahead 20 years since that moment, you'd almost expect everything to have the technical skills to play these types of games or interactive experiences. But I think your work is great because it shows that it's kind of an unsustainable model too. Like it's hard to do. You know, you have to imagine how to tell this story from a perspective of knowing that people have been doing this for two decades, mm -hmm. but we could still play these games with service to a better world rather than QAnon. <laughs> but it is possible. Hopefully. <laughs> but it is possible. But it does show that like the evolution of this is that during the that moment of transmedia experiences being part of a marketing place was the same time that people were using to technology to create their own transmedia experiences. Yeah. It feels like it's still the same. It feels like the, um, the main sort of vein of ARG stuff is still marketing material in 2022, which I'm surprised. I thought like not, not the part that we're all probably most excited about, although some of it is fantastic. Yeah, it, it's. I, I think that the crowdsourcing, like solving disappearances, and like which is just an uh, extension of what you mentioned about finding the where Survivor was taking place. Like that's that's all happening, and people are mad sometimes too, right? Like you, like uh, like you just. It's it, we've unleashed this these detectives, and <laughs> like is, is it. Is serial responsible for that? I mean, it's it's going been going on way before that stuff. All of that is is why I think I'm still excited about that about the the world. <clears throat> I mean, and I never never won't be. It's just part of me now. Yeah, and I'd love to dive a little bit into the world of rabbits. And it's interesting because you're telling this story that feels very very real. And part of the thing that allows the people who are playing rabbits to navigate through the world, even though you don't necessarily say it outright as synchronicity, right? They find a clue and then they go out into the world and they see this thing and it confirms what they either thought may have been true or what they were hoping wasn't true, right? And it's interesting. There's characters that mirror former writers, like there's uh, Dr. Robert Wilson, which reminded me of Dr. Robert Anton, or not Dr., but Robert Anton Wilson in uh, the first season of Rabbits. But synchronicity is kind of central to this and your storytelling. How do people experience this in the real world in this transmedia approach? Um, well, definitely moves into the real world. The synchronicity, I think I do reference Young and synchronicities in one. It's either the novel, one of the podcast series, or the second novel, which I'm writing right now, which hasn't come out. So <laughs> I can't I can't remember. But yeah, synchronicities are, are, are definitely central to, to rabbits. I, I feel like that's 
that that's kind of one of the places you might be able to find spirituality or or something else that's exciting is in these the idea of coincidence and the idea of um, connections that that you're making that may or may not be there but feel like that's the the Jungian coincidence like it has to feel meaningful right in order for it to be a synchronicity that's the the sort of what Jung said so that so that's that's always been part of rabbits for me is that that feeling of the feeling that it's meaningful. And so what if it really is meaningful is kind of like the whole, you know, rabbits theme. That's the heart. That's the soul. Right. And, and that, that goes back to your earliest work with the black tapes, right? When Dr. Strand is being called by Alex Regan, right? I just need to look at these tapes, she would say, right? I just need to look at this. I need to find the pattern. I need to find the connection. Uh, same thing with your cousin Nick and Tannis. And now in Rabbits, it is everywhere. And it's that heart and guiding soul that feels like it encourages the interactivity that makes this world possible, that allows us to extend or almost do the thing that Mark Zuckerberg wishes he could do. This feels like augmented reality, like we're layering a world on top of a world. And that really doesn't even require a headset. Yeah, I'm really excited about the potential of augmented reality in a way that isn't, uh, you know, graphics laid over uh, a, a screen or, or or a VR headset. Like there's so much, like there's so much potential for storytelling and for immersive like it just has to feel real. That's that's the only the only thing because it's called augmented reality. It's not you're not meant to be watching a cartoon or, or something. You know, like it's th there's got to be some there's got to be a level where it feels like it does in in you know the best of film and television. I think they do it quite something similar with overlays or with just like dystopian worlds and and in five minutes into the future technology. I'm excited about maybe the William Gibson peripheral might be a good show. We'll see. Love the book. Yes. I think switching to the narrative itself of, of Rabbits, the text, we get to see your experience in ARG through the view of a, of a narrator, Kay, and get to experience a very mind bending and world building overlay of reality as we, as the story unfolds. And what I like, I think the best before I ask a more broad question, I just, I, I just want to ask about the text itself, which kind of gives as you read and, and it kind of encourages the reader to play the game over so the first time is the instruction manual and the second time is the game and i feel like you there's a mention in the text of pinchon's gravity's rainbow which treats you teaches you how to read the text while you're reading it and i feel like as the book unfolds you go oh Okay. <laughs> so then you have to go back and be like, well, I've got to read this again, because now I know that there is a rules built into this. I, I know that the references are intentional, but how much should readers in this world, in the world we live in today, how much, re like our study, as you may know, is memes, we study graphical uh, communication and savvy nuance between things. There's a lot of references in the text. How much references are necessary for a reader of rabbits to feel like they've got it? Or do you feel like it's just enough for the reader to have the experience that's just in the book as a container? I think it's just uh, enough to read. I don't, I don't feel like there's, I think there's, there's certain, certain readers are going to, like everyone's just going to bring their own cultural experience to, to the references. But yeah, there's definitely nothing. You're not missing anything. If I mean, there are, you know, you are missing. There are some deeper sort of hidden layers in there, or at least one, one or two. But yeah, no, I, I, I feel like it's kind of like selfish for me. Like I just write what I would want to read. <laughs> like as, as a younger me, I'm like, oh my god, like this would, this is stuff that I've. Rabbits is really my obsessions from when I was. 14 or something right right like i'm uh, you know written in you know by an adult f for ad adults of course um or you know younger people too but like because i was reading adult stuff when i was a, a teenager and younger god way younger i read dune and far too young an age to but uh, you know the parts that got me got me I, I had to read it every year after that but yeah it's it's you know what i would be excited to to come across so all the references are are um you know and allusions and things are are there but yeah not not nothing required so in, in this this text the the multiverse plays a pretty big role as a macguffin in, in the story unfolding but what i like a lot is that that multiverse trope that's used quite often in other texts or other films is 
more of a, a trend when it comes to storytelling. Like we sort of like, we were afraid of robots in the 2014 with Ex Machina and all those other ones. We were afraid of the cyberspace in the 90s. Now we use multiverse to kind of have, it plays on our paranoia almost. It plays on the unknown that is so unknown, it's uncanny. When you're an ARG designer or a game designer or somebody who's working on this, do you take into account the matter of meta text, the text between the text and the information we have to know and be more confident of how the world operates? You mentioned at the beginning of this, like, if you're not cynical, you're not paying attention, you know? So it's like, is this, is this a good way for us to reread reality by using tropes like ARGs in the multiverse. Yeah, I wonder what it is that's that this is coming. I mean, for me, I, I came up with this thing in 2016 or something. So I, I'm sort of in the killer robot phase. I'm in the killer robot phase of... Uh, um, the, and, and the idea for Ra Rabbits was way before the black tape. So it's been in my mind, you know, percolating for a long time. But we could go into simulation theory. We could go into the end of civilization. Like there there are like is the like speaking of being cynical, um like let's say that what kind of multiverse stream are we living in with the the former president and the death of David Bowie and and um you know it, it prince there's another stream where all of the, everyone is still alive and we're fine and and we but democracy is fine and, and like nobody everyone doesn't hate everyone we're not we're trying to secede <laughs> like um i don't know this time is very um it's troubling but it's uh i don't know it does it feels like a very strange moment that could be the end of something so i don't know are we gonna end up you know hold up and you know gymnasiums while the world burns i, I don't even yeah it's a it's um, as long as there's not an incident where all of a sudden everyone's floating up towards the sky <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Right. <laughs> that's uh yeah well <laughs> it's so so it feels like you know looking at the the between the text stuff of of my book it's like such a luxurious thing to be able to consider like i wish i hope that the um <laughs> that we can we continue to uh you know be able to to look at stuff like that it's a it's a very very strange time so I just have one more question and then back to Josh. Um, it was, it's a question throwing back to the question, I think, of marketing almost. Um, do you think if David Fincher's 97 film, The Game, <laughs> were produced today, would it feel like rabbits? Would it feel like something like that? Or is that too small of a picture that was too myopic of a storytelling where rabbits takes a, an expansive world and everything's included in it? Well, the game is so brilliant. I mean, that was a huge movie for me, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I would, uh, it would, yeah, it would feel like the game. If it was released right now, it would be a huge hit. I think it would even, you know, it, I don't know how, how it did in 96 or seven, but it was like, yeah, it was big for me. I saw it in the theater. Yeah. The game. That's such a good movie. That's one of our references when wanting to, like, I've been on in the ongoing process of trying to turn process I'm, I'm canadian so process um of turning rabbits into a tv show and that's sort of like the touchstone of the game is is always in every conversation i mean that the, just the way that that show feels is is um exciting and I, I don't have another question except to say that i did enjoy the ending of the text of the of rabbits and uh, i felt it satisfied the gray god for me so <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> i i actually wanted to ask about um the end of the text so without giving away spoilers of the book rabbits which everyone should go out and purchase today as soon as they finish listening to this conversation can you explain how ambiguity is useful in particular with the ending of your works, for us to grapple with the unknown for what comes next, especially in an uncertain time when election integrity is being questioned and we're on the precipice of disastrous world-altering climate change. Why is this so important for audiences to get used to at a time when like you said earlier, so many things feel neat, whether it be Marvel Cinematic Universe building or other stories that feel insistent on delivering the full hero's journey. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure that um, that ambiguity 
for its own sake is uh, of interest. Although like, I will admit to preferring European cinema to more commercial American cinema now, you know, the new Hollywood of the seventies is fantastic. I, I, you know, I love speaking of cynicism, you know, those, are, that's the, that, that's the good stuff. Um, but yeah, for me, I don't really consider like, I feel like there are like over the, career there i mean obviously the movies have have a distinct um journey. there's a 90 minute cinematic journey we go on in a film and a novel a podcast like i feel like the first season of tannis is pretty wrapped up although but it but there's always you know a door left open because i feel like that's optimistic. I think maybe that's, that's my optimism. That's my one sort of way to be optimistic in, in, in the world. Um, I don't think there's such thing as pessimism. There's only realism, <laughs> optimism, realism slash cynicism. Everything just kind of like, uh, go, I, I do what, like the black tapes wasn't supposed to end. So it's supposed to continue. That's like a whole, we were supposed to trick the audience and have a little ARG kind of in between and then come back and we both got really busy. So that, uh, <laughs> that rage hasn't died down yet. But, but for, as far as like Tan Tannis and rabbits, the, the podcast, like rabbits has a very clear ending for season one of the podcast and then so season two as another character um tanis i mean there's five seasons now so there are different different ways in which each season ends i feel like one is very clean uh like three i think i don't even remember actually i can't speak to the other ones i don't remember right now um six is coming along but the rabbit's novel i didn't know that people thought it ended ambiguously i said i don't really read anything about the um like reviews or like interviews or reviews or anything. Well, it just is easy. Like it comes from the, um, from making movies and being like, some people love it. Some people don't, I don't really like, I sup I can't say I don't care because of course, like I'm human. I do care. I just found it better to not look online or to not go on Reddit or anything like that. Like, um, I learned cause I didn't like it. Like I would go there and I'd be like, what the fuck? What did you make? Shut up. You know, like I, like <laughs> at first, and then I'm like, I don't want to do that. You know? And then someone's like, I loved it. And it would take, you know, nine, I loved it to make up for the one shitty person who like is, you know, sad about their life. So yeah, I, uh, I, I don't really, so I didn't, I don't know, but I can see like, at, like thinking about it, like does rabbits end ambiguous? I mean, I feel like the construct of a game beginning and ending is kind of the construct of, of um, a chunk of rabbits, whether that be a podcast, a TV series or a book. And I feel like the, the iteration of the game ends in the book, spoiler alert, perhaps uh, <laughs> is, is that even clear? I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I get that. Um, also, I, I, like, I wanted to make another one. Like that wasn't, there wasn't, I didn't have a two book deal. So, you know, I, I had, that, that's, that's kind of flippant. I'm not, that's not really the case, but, but um, in, in retrospect, I can look back and say that it was effective in, in getting me uh, to, to write a second book in that world, which I'm really excited about, but no, it's, it was just the way that it was always going to end. And I thought it was a highly effective ending. And a lot of the conversation that I've seen around it, and a lot of it was done for the research of this podcast, was really, I would say, critical. I wouldn't say it's it fell into like the toxic fandom. I would say it was more so people debating which layer of reality or which universe uh, K may have been in. So it was a really interesting discourse. I, a lot of comparisons to existence, I think, as well which was super interesting. Yeah, death to Allegra Geller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, which is, I, I think, hugely complimentary uh, to the work that you're producing. So we, we've covered a lot in the hour that we've been chatting, but I'm curious, what comes next? You've constructed entire worlds and you tell the stories of things happening in our world at the same time. So you're working on a rabbit's television series and there's another rabbits book forthcoming there's a new season of the rabbits podcast that was released this summer what comes next and how do you envision your worlds continuing to develop yeah it's for rabbits uh, the second novel is meant to come out next year fall of 2023 i think but we'll see these things these things have already moved once well they may 
continue to move as I as I navigate that. Uh, the writing the book is so many words. Um, a podcast podcast is uh, is less words, so um, that may come out first. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, the, the, I'm really excited about visual storytelling. I haven't made a movie in God like I don't know six years, which used to be my full time job. I was writing direct films. That was like what I did. So I do miss the visual elements of storytelling, but they're definitely secondary to you know right now to um, the novel and more podcasts. Um, I'll have some new podcast stuff coming out that I've written and, and needs to be recorded. Um, which I'm really excited about. Uh, I, I have a show with Audible and Spotify coming up soon. So there there will be some some stuff. <laughs> and I think finally, how do you keep track of all of this? You you have so many projects and worlds. It's got to be tricky. A spreadsheet? No, I, it's, it's <laughs> be, from, from the very beginning when I decided that my job was going to be, you know, first uh, making movies then, or making music, then movies, then all of these things that are very difficult to make a living in at, I needed to spin dozens of plates to just to to pay the rent. So I've just never stopped. I don't feel comfortable stopping. Also because I procrastinate by making something new. It's the only thing that works for me. <laughs> if I really don't want to do something, I'll just create a new show. Um, that helps a lot. Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, Terry, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat about your wonderful worlds and stories today here on the Digital Void Podcast. Yeah, it was it was an honor. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Digital Void Podcast. For more about Miles, you can visit Minnow Beats Whale, where you can learn more about Miles and support his work. For full show notes and resources from today's episode, visit digitalvoid.media. And so we might say this is an experience of the void.